Hey everybody, uh, this is a piece uh, by uh, Joachim Brunn titled From Anti-Zionism to Anti-Semitism. Um, looks like the underlying heading uh, says uh, Zionism is a wrong answer to anti-Semitism. Zionism, however, was the only historically appropriate answer. Um, this says uh, it was originally... There's a little footnote here. It says this article was written by Joachim Brunn and was published originally published in 1997 in the German newspaper Jungle World. Footnotes were added by the translator to explain certain German terms which are untranslatable. And speaking of problems of translation, I'm going to read... Um, there might be somewhere else that where this is available. Um... But I'm going to read like the little uh, introduction to Joachim Brunn uh, that's on uh, the German Wikipedia, translated to English with Google Translate. So, let's make sure I'm pronouncing his name right first. That's important, isn't it? Brun. Joachim Brun. One last time. Let me make sure just to make is it Joachim. Joachim Brun. Seems like it's an E. Joachim Brun lived from 1955 to 2019 and was a German political journalist and publisher. Brun was a member of the KPD slash AO in the 1970s and then became a member of the Socialist Office. Here, Joachim Brun also wrote for the magazine Lynx, which is left in German. Joachim Brun's turn to the Greens was the reason why he left the SB in the early 1980s. I'm guessing SB is the abbreviation of the Socialist Office. Brun was a member of the Freiburg Socialist Forum Initiative. So he had been a member of the Freiburg Socialist Forum Initiative since 1981 and co-operator of the Ka'ira Publishing House. Brun was one of its co-founders. Uh, that's where I'm getting this article that I'm about to read, from anti-Zionism to anti-Semitism. It's from that, uh, that um, publishing house, Ka'ira Publishing House. Brun is one of its founders. Since 1990, Brun has published the first six volumes of Johannes Agnoli's works. There's pieces by Johannes Agnoli on this channel. Um, it was Johannes Agnoli, I think, is kind of mostly known in the West because he was in some of his articles have been featured in books put out by Werner Bonefeld. Um, the in the uh, Sage Handbook of Frankfurt School Critical Theory. Uh, uh, Johannes Agnoli's book is written uh, by a uh, person named uh, Stefan Grigat, um, who was affiliated with um, anti-Deutsch thought like Joachim Brun is. Um, since 1990, Joachim Brun has published the first six volumes of Johannes Agnoli's works. After Agnoli's death in 2003, Agnoli's widow, Barbara Gures, Agnoli demanded legal access to the publisher's sales of Agnoli's work, as well as the withdrawal of the posthumously published three-volume Transformation of Post-Nazism, which Stefan Grigat edited and which contained one of Agnoli's last texts. The dispute, which brought the Ka'ira publishing house to the brink of bankruptcy, ended with a settlement in November 2006. Agnoli's writings were not republished by the publisher. As a political theorist, Brun referred to the critical theory of Theodore W. Adorno in particular and the Marx reconstruction of the Neue Marx Lectura, from which Joachim Brun derived a radical criticism of the state and for the period after 1933, a radical rejection of the workers' movement. Joachim Brun was one of the most influential authors of, within the anti-German movement, which also subjected the left to radical criticism. Quote, 
There can be no criticism of the state of Israel that is not anti-Semitic, dot, dot, dot. The task of anti-German communists is not to identify with Israel because Israel is not the substitute for the, quote, fatherland of the working people, end quote. But to clarify, quote, but to clarify why, quote, it is necessary to unconditionally stand behind Israel and also behind Ariel Sharon, namely in the interests of the stateless and classless world society, end quote. Joachim Brun, 2003. In a text written on the occasion of his death, Joachim Brun characterized the, quote, initiative socialist forum, end quote, which he co-founded as follows, quote, for Joachim Brun, I don't know who's saying this, um, but says, quote, for Joachim Brun, Joachim Brun, the unconditional stand for Israel as the unequal state of survivors and those persecuted as Jews is one of the core criticisms. Is the dual character of the Jewish state is a belated result of the Zionist emancipation movement of the Jews and their state-organized self-defense against the continuation of the final solution, which combines the categorical imperative after Auschwitz with Marx's, quote, to overthrow all conditions in which man is degraded, is an enslaved and abandoned, a contemptible being, end quote. Because Auschwitz is to be understood as, so to speak, a, quote, transcendental horizon above every possible history of humanity, end quote, end quote. An obituary says of Brun's style, quote, in general, criticism was Brun's profession. To Joachim Brun, it was much more than a method. Criticism was the pivotal point of Brun's thinking. In the Marxian tradition, Brun saw criticism not as a dissecting knife, but as a weapon that does not want to refute its object, but rather to deal with its object. Once the wrong has been, quote, definitely recognized and specified, end quote, it is already, quote, an index of what is right and better, end quote, says Adorno. This is why Joachim Brun, unlike many others with whom he was able to argue excellently, did not leave behind a self-contained work, a magnum opus. Joachim Brun's stylistic device was the small form of the essay and the essay, which is far more appropriate to the experiences to which he soon referred than the historically discredited overall presentation. The monograph and the philosophical system. Brun's insights are almost always expressed in a discussion of the unreasonable demands that he was exposed to in the FAZ, the the Süddeutsche Zeitung, and Jungewald, the Greens, or academic Marxism, end quote. Jan Georg Gerber. Brun's texts have been published in magazines Concrete, Jungle World, Bahamas, Bahamas, IZ3W, San Frase, and Arbeiterkampf. Joachim Brun was also co-editor of the discontinued magazine Critique and Crisis. According to Brun's will and testament, all rights to his text belong to Katja Therlag. Um, his publication selection, these are all books in German, so these are like the uh, English translated titles of the books. Um, but uh, this is a, the first uh, book he... Um, the first book on the list is Riots and Revolution, which is a, or a piece, which is in... The Old Road Traffic Regulations, REF Documents, with contributions by Wolfgang Port, who was an important member of anti-Germans, uh, K. Hartung, G Gabriela Guffela, Joachim Brun, Karl Heinzroth, Karl Heinzroth being um, like the representative of... Um, like the German, like he, I think he writes writes for uh, was like one of the main people with like uh, Wildcat Germany, which was like uh, the German, like like affiliation, like informal affiliation of like uh, Italian uh, operismo. Um, wrote a very good book about um, a uh, very good uh, essay about uh, Marcel van der Linden. Uh, which is very good. It's in like a book that he edited to honor Marcel van der Linden. Um, but uh, yeah, um, the other book piece by uh, Joachim Brun was Materialism and Barbarism, Pamphlets and Essays. 
published in 2004 by the friends of Joachim Brun on the fifth anniversary of his death, uh, which is German on the critical theory of the nation from 1994, Patience and Irony, Johannes Agnoli on his 70th birthday, edited with Manfred Dahlmann and Clemens Nachtmann, Criticism of Politics, Johannes Agnoli on his 75th birthday, also edited with Manfred Dahlmann and Clemens Nachtmann. That's from 2000. Also wrote uh, on the dialectics of the counter-enlightenment about the empty passage of time and the left's progress on its way into the abyss. Uh, a book he edited with Jan Gerber titled Red Army Fiction from 2007. Uh, the logic of anti-Semitism, the economic slash sociological reduction of the concept of value and its consequences in Sans Phrase, or Sans Phrase, Volume 17, uh, Winter 2021-21. Uh, the loneliness of Theodor Herzl, the hatred of Israel and the work of materialist criticism of the state. Uh, it's a piece from uh, Sans Phrase uh, in 2020. Um, a lecture called Nothing Learned and Nothing Forgotten from 2010. Uh, Joachim Brun, The Organized No, uh, from Sans Phrase, that's from 2018, it's a piece from 2018. Uh, conversation with Johannes Agnoli, the destruction of the state using the means of Marxism and Golism. <laughs> so there we are. We have some background on who Joachim Brun is. So, now we actually can read the text. That's the uh, title of the video. Everyone speaks of, quote, Zionism, end quote, instead of Israeli nationalism. What is to be thought of Zionism and anti-Zionism in lights of materialist notion, a materialist notion of the nation? And why is it correct to claim that anti-Zionism is merely the left-wing appearance of anti-Semitism? One, critique of the state instead of anti-Zionism. What the UN, pressured by the Arab and Soviet camp, condemned in 1975 as the, quote, racist essence of Zionism, end quote, is the essence of statehood itself, homogeneity and homogenization of individuals to form a state's people and thereby the material for domination. Anti-Zionism, however, displays a peculiar yet revealing lack of interest in this unique process of ex nihilo constitution of a civil state power, this historically unprecedented ke precedented catching up to statehood. In a time lapse, the founding of Israel carried out the process of primitive accumulation, accumulation, which had taken over 200 years in Europe, on the indigenous population. It did not, however, attempt to compensate the subsistence farmers who were set free in the course of agricultural capitalization with industrialization. For this reason, the founding of Israel appears to the bourgeois philo semite as an unprecedented miracle, and to the left-wing anti-Zionist as pure cruelty. However, in their German nationalist reverence and their tanky-esque outrage, tanky outrage diversion alike, these critics of Israel have nothing in mind than their self-referential illusion of the good state, be it nationalist or socialist. The, quote, artificiality of the Zionist entity, end quote, which anti-Zionism laments so much about Israel, lies precisely in the Jewish state's failure to claim the false naturalness and pseudo-origin of Ab Ovo, which in Europe served as a smokescreen for absolutism's transformation to civil statehood. What the hell is Ab Ovo? Ab Ovo means from the beginning. Standing under the spell of the idealist slogan of the quote, right to self determination, end quote. The anti-Zionists treat the question of the constitution of statehood like any theory of constitutionality and the state would, as a problem of morals and of rights. They talk about the crucial question of whether the Jews even constitute a folk and can therefore lay claim to national rights. Footnote. 
The German noun das Volk, literally, quote, the people, end quote, const a, to, constitutes a particular, a peculiar triple entendre. First, Volk, das Volk, can refer to inhabitants of a place, quote, the townspeople, end quote, as in Field Volk war auf den Straßen, quote, many people were out and about in the streets, end quote. This meaning is largely synonymous with the word <coughs> Velk Bevuk Erang, quote, population, end quote. Secondly, it is used to refer to an ethnic and or national collective as in Das Deutsche Volk, quote, the German people, end quote, which depending on whether the speaker believes in ethnic ius sanguinis, sanguinis or civil ius, Soli means to say, quote, people of German blood, end quote, or, quote, German citizens, end quote. Joachim Brun has criticized both of these definitions as ideological oscillations around the central capitalist problem of subjectivization. Thirdly, folk has been and continues to be used by the political left, including Marxists, to refer to notions ranging from the eulogized, quote, simple people, end quote, to the adored, quote, oppressed peoples, end quote. What Brun says above must therefore be understood in the sense that both left and right wing anti Zionists measure the Jewish state up against their restrictive notion of an authentic folk. Hereafter, wherever the original text says folk, it is translated as cursive uh, people. Um, I think it means, might mean as italicized people, but I'm not sure because people. As it says cursive and then people's italicized. So I don't know. End of footnote. Um, back to the text. Back to the text. Uh, Anti-Zionists prefer to talk about the crucial question of whether the Jews even cons constitute a folk and can therefore lay claim to national rights. Anti-Zionists continuously recycle the criteria of what constitutes a people but never approach the answer which is that the political unity of a people is by no means derived from language, culture, history, or the like, but rather from the establishment of a political centrality capable of setting and asserting borders. The criteria that nationalism establishes for a people's existence, both in its left-wing and right-wing disposition, are arbitrary illustrations of a sovereign rule already established, or of a movement eager to found a state. Being the Jews' national liberation movement, Zionism faces the dilemma of having to constitute more precisely, of having a will, to will the Jews as a people and as the basis of legitimate state power, which is to say of producing a people whose positive commonality at the beginning of the 20th century, apart from some remainders of religious tradition, existed only in a negativity of common persecutions past present, and future. The Jews' commonality as a people could not be derived from their unquestionable unity as a state, pow as a state power's material. Neither could it be reconstructed on the basis of an undoubted synthesis as subjects of an economy, nor could it be brought about as confessors of a mutual faith. The objective reason of their affiliation as a community of the persecuted necessarily remains hidden to the Jews whether they organize as bourgeois or proletarian assimilationists, or alternatively as civic or socialist nationalists. Section 2. Merit and Dilemma of Zionism Theodor Herzl and the Zionist movement's founding fathers had better anticipated the virulence of anti-Semitism than allegedly scientific socialism. Um, Theodor Herzl is like the... Um, one of the, like he said, is like the, one of the founding fathers of Zionism. But I have never, like, I'm not an expert on Herzl, so I'm going to look up the introduction to him on Wikipedia. So, according to Wikipedia, Theodor Herzl, who lived from 1860 to 1904, was an Austro-Hungarian Jewish journalist, lawyer, writer, playwright, and political activist who was the father of modern political Zionism. Herzl formed the Zionist organization and promoted Jewish immigration to Palestine in an effort to form a Jewish state. Due to Herzl's Zionist work, he is known in Hebrew as Hoaz Ha 
Medina, uh, quote, visionary of the state, end quote. Tito Herzl is specifically mentioned in the Israeli Declaration of Independence and is officially referred to as the, quote, spiritual father of the Jewish state, end quote. Tito Herzl was born in past kingdom of Hungary to a prosperous neolog Jewish family. After a brief legal career in Vienna, he became the Paris correspondent of the Viennese newspaper Neue Freie Presse. Confronting, confronted with anti-Semitic events in Vienna, Tito Herzl reached the conclusion that anti-Jewish sentiment would make Jewish assimilation impossible, and that the only solution for Jews was the establishment of a Jewish state. In 1896, Herzl published the pamphlet Der Judenstaat, in which Herzl elaborated his vision of a Jewish homeland. Herzl's ideas attracted international attention and rapidly established Herzl as a major figure in the Jewish world. In 1897, Herzl convened the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland, and was elected president of the Zionist organization. Theodor Herzl began a series of diplomatic initiatives to build support for a Jewish state, appealing unsuccessfully to German Emperor Wilhelm II and Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid II. At the Sixth Zionist Congress in 1903, Herzl presented the Uganda Scheme, endorsed by the colonial secretary Joseph Chamberlain on behalf of the British government. The proposal, which sought to create a temporary refuge for the Jews in British East Africa, allowing the Kishinev excuse me, following the Kishinev pro pogrom, was met with strong opposition and ultimately rejected. Herzl died of a heart attack in 1904 at the age of 44 and was buried in Vienna. In 1949, his remains were taken to Israel and reinterned at Mount Herzl. Back to the text. Theodor Herzl and the Zionist movement's founding fathers had better anticipated the virulence of anti-Semitism than allegedly scientific socialism. The paradox of being persecuted without giving any cause to do so, the logical contradiction of being put in the center of social aggression without being guilty, the absurd occurrence that capitalized Western societies and semi-Asiatic Eastern societies alike albeit for different reasons, were preparing for the preemptive strike, although Jewish existence did nothing to invite, prompt, or justify it. This objectively absurd phenomenon they could impossibly grasp. However, realizing that capital and the state process the contradictions of their innermost workings falsely, but reliably, by means of anti-Semitism, by mean, would not have helped them in the least. So-called scientific socialism, on the other hand, which after all correctly explained the hatred against Jews as a, quote, socially constituted, end quote, problem that, quote, could only be suspended socially, end quote, always remained far below the practical level of Zionism, which falsely interpreted anti-Semitism to be anthropologically caused and eternally irremediable. This false prognosis has stood the test like no other nationalisms because anti-Semitism, while in itself being far from eternal, tends to be forcibly eternalized by capitalist world society. Quote, the Jew, end quote, is a projection of bourgeois society, which in the manner of a redirected action attempts to overcome its antagonism through his persecution. The critique of all national liberation movements is aimed at Zionism as well, in a form, however, that has to reflect upon the social configuration of the anti-Semitic question. Every critic of Zionism as Israeli nationalism must consider its it, instance. Uh, every critic of Zionism as Israeli nationalism must consider it insincere to gleefully denounce the only reaction which remained for Jews after the bankruptcy of bourgeois enlightenment and the failure of proletarian world revolution. Zionism is the wrong answer to anti-Semitism, which in horrendous hindsight, has proved itself to be the only provisionally adequate answer in history. In contrast, the only right answer, revolution for a stateless and classless society, has been humiliated by Stalinism to the point of being an unworldly utopia of fringe lunatics. 
Seen from the pers this perspective, Israel is the only available means of self-defense against rampant worldwide anti-Semitism, even though Israel is not a final bulwark. Every single Jew's entitlement to Israeli citizenship is far from solving the anti-Semitic question. However, it is a first great historical achievement, at least in a world of nation-states, in which, like the fates of stateless people prove, being human means little, whereas being a citizen of a state at least means something. Precisely because the assertion that the Jews are merely a religious group, and because of that, nothing but else but citizens of their respective states, has long been refuted by history, most recently by all means of which a German Volksgemeinschaft is capable. Israel's existence is indispensable. 3. The left and the Volksgemeinschaft. Because after Auschwitz, modern anti-Semitism is forced to appear as anti-Zionism, Israel, the Judenstadt, Jew state, is awarded the usual projection. It is the ideal canvas both for bourgeois and for alternative left nightmares, especially in Germany. What they themselves want, but precisely prove to be incapable of, is insinuated as the Israelis, quote, Excuse me, as the Israelis' intent and action. Only against this backdrop, the obtrusive question, the obtrusive suggestion that Israelis think of themselves as the quote chosen people end quote, and the world's potential saviors can be understood. It is envy of their supposed advantages. Allegedly, the Jews are the ones denying equality. What comes to light in their denunciation as elitist, arrogant, in short enemies of the people, and as being more equal than others, is their accuser's own perception of being called to higher things and craving to no long, not longer have their light put under a bushel. In the imagination of the anti-Semite, the Jews have what he wants to have and prevent him from attaining it, blood ties that are thicker than water, national identity, community as a people, unquestionable unity as a natural and racial feature, synthesis of individual and society beyond generalized competition and envy. The atomized individuals, socially deprived of reason and thrown back to their mere intellect, long for their demise and their merging into a repressive collective, which can finally bring forth serenity, order, and a tangible overview. That which stands as an obstacle and opposition to this wish is projected on the essence of Jewishness, redemption from which can only come about by its extermination. In addition to this projection, delusions of persecution arise, the political expression of paranoia. Those with hallucinatory fear of their own impending annihilation will not be lacking in reasons for self-defense. To them, the Jews are the, quote, anti-race, end quote, Hitler, and their state-like entity is the antithesis to proper statehood. Modern anti-Semitism exists in spite, excuse me, not in spite, but precisely because of Auschwitz. It will never pardon the Jews for Auschwitz, nor forgive the Jews for cheating the Germans out of their Volksgemeinschaft. What stands out is that, quote, Zionism, end quote, as it is used by German, quote, anti-Zionists, end quote, is more than just a name for Jewish nationalism before the foundation of Israel and for Israeli nationalism afterwards. When the Israeli left calls its critique of the nationalism of Israeli society and its state anti-Zionism, the term is a merely customary denomination for that critique. In Germany, and among international friends of the homogenous people, quote, Anti-Zionism, end quote, is generally an indicator of projection and therefore not a mere denomination of what could possibly be called differently, but rather a cipher and a code. In it, there is a resonation and discrete sense of what the left thinks and feels, but what only the right dares to say publicly. Why did left-wingers even distance themselves from the anti zion anti sionist excuse me, it's in German, anti sionist actionistische action of Michael Kunin, 
when they have never criticized anti-Zionism in itself. And although they themselves allege the Zionist Jews of harboring the religious obsession with power of a, quote, chosen people, end quote, instead of adhering to a regular raison d'etat. Let me look this up. This anti-Zionistische action. And this uh, Michael Kunin person. Or Michael Kunin. A group of German neo-Nazis appeared in the 1980s and 1990s under the name Anti-Zionist Action. The Anti-Zionist Action was an initiative launched in Munich in the 1980s by the former leader of the German fascist movement, Michael Kunin. and Ingrid Weckert. Right-wing extremists, especially anti-Semitic ideas, were subsumed under the slogan, quote, fight against Zionism, end quote. With the state of Israel as a Jewish state, the USA, but also Jewish Germans serving as points of attack. Anti-Zionist action was one of several attempts to set up front organizations of the new front GDNF community. Um, it says that Michael Kunin, uh, who lived from 1955 to 1991, was a leader of the German neo-Nazi scene in the 1980s. That's from the German uh, Wikipedia. Um, back now, I can I'll read the um, what it says on the. Wikipedia, English Wikipedia. Michael Kunin, lived from 1955 to 1991, was a leader in the German neo-Nazi movement. Michael Kunin was one of the first post-World War II Germans to openly embrace Nazism and call for the formation of a Fourth Reich. Michael Kunin enacted a policy of setting up several differently named groups in an effort to confuse German authorities, who were attempting to shut down neo-Nazi groups. Kunin's homosexuality was made public in 1986, and Kunin died of HIV-related complications. So, uh, let me reread the text. Um, in it, there is a resonation and discrete sense of what the left thinks and feels, but only the right dares to say publicly. Why did left-wingers even distance themselves from the anti sionistische action of Michael Kunin when left-wingers have never criticized anti-Zionism in itself? And although left-wingers themselves allege the Zionist Jews of harboring the religious obsession with power of a, quote, chosen people, end quote, instead of adhering to a regular raison d'etat. As a precondition for any and all discussion, Zionism is to be understood as the Jewish National Liberation Movement. And thereafter, that it is a denomination of Israeli nationalism which cannot be employed in Germany. The end. I thank you for listening, and I thank you for listening to the introduction and uh, me looking things up. Um, I appreciate it. Um, thanks for listening.